Good morning. I got something pestering me this morning, so I'm going to make sure. I'm, I've, got <laughs> I've got the tool to take care of him. Hopefully it doesn't, doesn't bother me too much this morning. But anyways, you know, I'm blown away. You know, God is so good. You know, we had a little bit of wind last week, you know, but, uh, but these are the days of Elijah. They are. You know, preparing the way of the Lord. You know, when the disciples were on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they saw Elijah and Moses, and, and, uh, and, then, and then Peter goes, hey, Jesus, Jesus, we got to make some tabernacles. we gotta, we got to build some tents, you know, for, for these guys, you know. And then, boom, all of a sudden, this cloud comes over, the voice of the Father, this is my son whom I love. And then, you know, the f- disciples, man, they passed out. This was too much for them. And they woke up, and everybody's gone. And, uh, and uh, they, they asked, you know, is, is, it, it says in your word that, that uh, the scribes say that Elijah must come first. And uh, Jesus kind of responded to them. He says, yes, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And at the same time, he says, Elijah did come. And referring to John the Baptist. But Elijah is coming again. Before Jesus comes, the second coming, riding through the clouds. But the year of Jubilee, you know, everybody know what the year of Jubilee is? That's it's when, it's when everything was restored. All the debts were erased, you know. And, and you know, to some degree, you know, the, the, the wealthy, the ones that acquired all those, those lands and stuff for the debt and stuff, you know, it, it was kind of like a, a downer, right? You know, oh, man, we got to give it all back. But uh, they got all their stuff back, and it was a restoration of all things, um, All debts were erased. What will Elijah restore? Elijah does come. He will restore all things. You know, these days look like no other in the history of our world. I mean, from our perspective, from our understanding, whoa, what's going on with our world? Uh, You know, but but, uh, we learned in, in Ezekiel or Ecclesiastes in our men's breakfast that there's nothing new under the sun. You know, how many of you all know what special day today is today? What's a special day today? It's Reformation Day. Reformation Day. Uh, this is, uh, you know, we think the world's bad now. Think about when Martin Luther was there. 500, that was 2000, no, it was, his, it was 1517, October 31st that Martin Luther went to the church door and he nailed the 95 theses on the church door. And, you know, he was, he was, he was everything in that 95 thesis was right out of here on the church door. And when he put that on the church door, he fled for his life because the Pope, the church, everything concerned with the church. I mean, this, this, this was a world order. The church was the world religion, but it was also the church, it was the world government. And here's Martin Luther, and he's, he's saying, man, your, your church, your doctrines, the things that you're saying, it doesn't match what God's word says. And he put 95 things there that, that, are, that are wrong with the Catholic church, and then he nailed it on there, and he fled October 31st, 5, 1517. You know, he may as well have jumped off a cliff. You know, the whole world was against him. You know, he hid for a little bit, but, but he went against the most powerful deep state, more powerful than the deep state today. But God protected him. Along with all the false doctrine and all the fo- other stuff nailed on the door was wisdom. You know, there was other stuff nailed on the the door about penances, this is the time you need to do your penances, this is how much you need to, you know, but, uh, you know, wisdom is often found right alongside of folly. Let's turn to Luke 11.5. You know, I get to thinking that God is so close to coming because of the state of the world. When Elijah comes, he will turn the hearts of the father to the children. You know, this group, this youth group that we have is an eye-opener. You know, some of these kids, you know, you you think, young kids, what are they up to? But no good, right? 
But, but some of those kids, man, they're so influential. They're so, they're into God's word. I'm, I'm competing with Logan. I mean, he's, 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 got, he's got time in God's word that he's participating daily. And, I, and other kids, you know, the other kid that heard, wrote, did his groin on the football team. And, and uh, you know, um, I just heard that Zarin, man, he wants to lead a little bit of youth. But uh, they're, they're in tune. They're, they're trying to make their way into this world, doing something good. You know, I've asked them some stuff. You know, how, how do they stay pure with all the bombardment that, that, that comes with this day and age technological advice, devices? I mean, we, we almost can't live without technological advices, right? You know? I don't have mine on me this morning. I feel naked. But, uh, but, but how, do you, how do you stay pure? And, and, and there are passage ways that, that bring about communication, trade, and almost everything under the sun. These are like gates. In a sense, these kids are growing up in this technology. And God has given them the grace and wisdom to circumvent the onslaught of the wickedness in this realm. You know, and I pray that God gives them the spirit of Elijah. And that they build clean algorithms and close off negative ones. Even the censorship of a, a lot of the conservative stuff. The post, if we are intentional in looking and searching for truth, it is still there. Nailed on the door for all to see. You know, this world sees it as an inconvenient truth, but it is still searchable and available. In Luke 11, starting with verse 5, And he said to them, Which of you as a friend, has a friend, will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though, he will not get up to give him anything because he is his friend. Yet, because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will, give, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? It kind of gives you a clue as to what we're going to ask for, right? What are we asking for? We're asking for life. We need the Holy Spirit. Please, let's turn to Ecclesiastes 1.18. You know, what, what, is, what is your life goal? You know, think about it. What, 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 it. what is my goal in life? You know, you ask, sometimes you ask, if you, if you would ask me a long time ago when I was a kid, you know, I want to be rich, right? That's my goal. I just, you know, I, then I could have everything, right? But what's our life goal? You know, Jesus seemed to indicate that the ultimate purpose in life is to be with the Father, restored to the Father, a relationship with the Father, he said, no one comes to the Father but through me. You know, eternal life is just the byproduct of salvation. Having a relationship with the Father restored is salvation's purpose. We have been given a ministry of reconciliation. Elijah comes to restore all things. You know, what does Jubilee mean for us? The father is better than earthly fathers. In fact, it says, you know, you, though you're a wicked father, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your father give to those that ask them the Holy Spirit? 
This Holy Spirit is good for any era. You know, we live in an age of increased knowledge. Knowledge is, is up here, but, but we have that pocket knowledge, you know, with, with all our technology. But there's a knowledge gate in that pocket, a door to explore. You know, in men's group, we, we ran across the last verse of Ecclesiastes 1, you know, and, and we looked at what, what's the purpose of knowledge? What, what, what does it do? What benefit does it do? And, and we looked at this, and of course, this is, this is written for those under the sun, not under the, uh, the S-U-N, not the S-O-N. But uh, in verse 18, it says, for in much wisdom is much vexation. Vexation is grief, problems, frustration. And he in, who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Let's turn to Proverbs 1.20. So I mean, that, that, that kind of gives you a purpose. Hey, what's, what's, what's the use for wisdom anyways? The more you know, the worse you feel. Um, but uh, there have always been two influences at the gates. It goes way back. It isn't, it isn't the new technology that, whoa, look at all this junk on this. Oh, I can't touch it. It's always been at the gates, two influences in our world. It isn't the new technology that will be to blame for man's falling away from God, but the laziness and wickedness of the heart of man. The gates may have moved, but the ones sitting and calling from the gates haven't changed. I've been preaching out of the Old Testament so much that we're still in there, but it's just so huge. Proverbs 120, wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of it, the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gate, she speaks. How long, O simple ones? Will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you and I will make my words known to you. And I, I, I think that's, that's the key to, to knowledge and wisdom is, is, is God's Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> Please, let's turn to Proverbs 8. He will pour out his spirit to you. If wisdom is there for those who seek, knock and ask. In Proverbs 8, starting with verse 1. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights, besides the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gate in the front of the town, at the entrance of the portal, she cries aloud. To you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. O simple ones, learn prudence. O fools, learn sense. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. For my mouth will utter truth, wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. For they are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. And I find knowledge in distress and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. Please, let's turn to Proverbs 9, 13. You know, if, if wisdom is shouting from every media point in the system, you know, why, why pardon the expression... Are there, so many, are there so many idiots out there? Right? Why, why isn't this wisdom gaining some entrance into our lives or into the lives of people so that they, they learn something? These are times that I wish, you know, I had hair to pull out. The fear. 
The fear of the Lord is, opens the ear canal to hear the algorithm of life. You know, and, and the fear of the Lord, you know, when, when, when we're going through, um, through stuff, when we're going through the city gates, when we're going uh, and, and passing by billboards and, and uh, going through the internet and, and all that information stuff, the fear of the Lord is what says, oh man, I got to out, out, out. And you build an algorithm of righteousness, okay, in our minds, in our hearts, and with everything we do. And that's, that's kind of what, uh, what, the, what the kids were telling me. It says, uh, you know, after, after a while, the algorithm starts, starts forming itself to, to your way. And, and to a certain degree, if I, if I get onto your personal computer or your personal devices, I'm going to find out what you're interested in. Your YouTube, your all those stuff, what you're interested in, just by looking at what kind of information is being plummeted on your, on your, on your device. And so I, I challenge you, what's, what, is, what, is, what is your algorithm on, on your devices now? And, and if it's something that you say, man, it's just, it's not God glorifying, maybe there's something here, that fear of the Lord, that needs to change. You know, wouldn't it be great if, if God censored out all the speech he hated? You know, that's, that's, that's the one, one thing in verse 13. It says, pride, arrogance, and the, the way of evil and perverted speech, I hate. Perverted speech, that's, that's the first place I ever see hate speech going in there. What speech do we hate? Someday... It'll, the only thing coming in through the gates will be good. All the outside stuff will be left out. But while we live in this reality of good and evil, wisdom and righteousness are not the only speech out there. In these little instruments we have, there's both the speech of wisdom and folly. At the gates, in the streets, and at the doors, there is sin clawing at the same door as wisdom. You know, I'm reminded, you know, right at the start, and God is talking with Cain. Cain's a little upset because God's, God's honoring Abel's sacrifice. And, and God says, Cain, Cain, don't you know that sin is crouching at the door waiting to have you? And it's, it's at our doors too. The fear of the Lord is the one that is going to censor that stuff out for us. It will. You will feel it. You will say, hey, man, it, 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 it'll be automatic. In Proverbs 19, this is, this is the stuff that, that is also at the gates. The woman folly is loud. She is seductive. And knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat in the highest places of the town. Calling on those who pass by. Who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says, Stolen water is sweet. And bread eaten in this secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there. That her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Please, let's turn to Luke 1.5. What's lurking at our gates? What, 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 is, what is crouching at our door? What desires to have us? We can control that. You know, as fathers, we need to teach wisdom when we rise up, when we walk along the way, right? When we sit down and when we lay down. Not only that, we're, 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 we're to write them on our doorposts and on, on the door frames and, and on our gates. We're supposed to have them dangling as frontlets from, from our eyes. I mean, this is, the, this is where we're supposed to be. This is what the connections need to be. Everything, every gateway, every action needs to be filled with the fear of the Lord. One, one of my favorite stories growing up was Pilgrim's Progress. 
You know, I, I think I may have been in the, in the second grade when I was going to Christian school and, and they read the whole book to me. And I was so enthralled with little Pilgrim, you know, as he, as he left the city of destruction and, and, and left his family behind. And, he, and he's, he's sitting there, can't they see that this place is going to be destroyed and it's going to be fire and all that stuff? And he, he's making his way. And then sometimes he gets some temptations and it's distraught and he's carrying this crazy burden. And then finally he gets to the cross and his burden rolls away and he feels so good. And then he starts continuing on as Christian, you know, not just Pilgrim, Christian. And he, and he's going through, and then, then even as a Christian, he, he goes through all kinds of trouble, the, the sea of despondence, and, and then he sees all kinds of different ways that he could go. And throughout it all, you know, he meets different people like Faith. And, and, uh, but anyways, he ends up at, and he battles his way to the celestial city. You know, we live in days like these. You know, John Bunyan, I don't know if you know, in 1678, he wrote this book from a prison. Why? Because he was, he was preaching this. 1678, John Bunyan. And at one time, Pilgrim's Progress was the second most translated book in all the world other than the Bible. You know, we live in the days of Elijah, Martin Luther, Moses, Ezekiel, John Bunyan. The Apostle Paul also wrote a lot of his books from prison. There's nothing new under the sun. You know, all this information, folly and wisdom, the fear of the Lord. Remember that, the fear of the Lord, Lord God. What are you doing? Where is wisdom? Am I seeking that out? Man, am I, am I, am I vigilantly knocking? Am I vigilantly asking? Am, am I, what am I, what's crouching at the door? And what am, I, what am I aware of? God. You know, we look at all these technologies and hidden agendas, and then we go to our Bibles. This has the answer. There's nothing new under the sun. And we still haven't caught up with what is written in here. God is still there. The Holy Spirit is still there for those who keep seeking and keep knocking and keep asking. You know, there, there's still hope for the next generation. There's still a reason and a purpose to continue to meet and be a part of the body of Christ and to tell the next generation. You know, even when we're old and advanced in years, and here we are, uh, in uh, Luke 1, 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his di division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of the incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and, he f and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And, to the, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. To make ready for the Lord a people prepared. A people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, 
I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service had ended, he went to his home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. I remember Irene Travis saying to me, I can't do much of anything anymore. And that woman prayed. She prayed for for me to stay here. You know, if you want to blame her, she's already gone, so. But I would always tell her, you know, I can't do much. I always tell her, you know, you do more with your prayer than I can with my youth and vigor. At that time, I was a little younger too. But, 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 but I started out observing the youth. Yeah, yes, some of them might be struggling. You know, I, I, I looked, at, looked at Holly, you know, way back in the day. And I remember when she was in high school, and, and I prayed that she would get a spark for the Lord in her. You know, it would have been easy to give up hope. You know, and, and as, as Tyson and Rochelle, um, and we sat after youth group last Sunday night, and, and we were just sitting there talking, and we were, we were talking about this youth kid and this youth kid, and, and, and you know, what, what can we do? What can we do to get the spark going? There's so many distractions that must be blocked out. But it isn't our job to censor hate speech, but to expose it and drown it out with wisdom. You know, this, this, this spirit of Elijah, you know, we live in those days when the Holy Spirit will be given to those who ask of the Father. You know, and, and there's a point in, in life when, when we give them up to the Father, when we, when we have that Holy Spirit, you know, we don't got to censor out the The junk, because we're so focused, we're so filled with the Holy Spirit, there isn't room for the junk. Elijah, John the Baptist, came to make ready a people prepared. His was a baptism of repentance to prepare the way of the Lord and restore all things. He is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. His message goes out to the prodigal. You know, turn, turn around from trying to satisfy your hunger with the slop that the pigs are eating. The slop of the world. Return to the Father through Jesus who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You know, I'm so excited for next week, baptism service. You know, that may be the first baptism performed in this church ever, water baptism. We'll explore the spiritual baptism of the Father, of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. You know, the Old Testament goes deep into the symbolism of the law, the sacrifice, and the incense, as it also gives wisdom in repentance, redemption, and regeneration with water representing judgment, cleansing, and sustaining in the complete work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as we, as we explore the representation of this water in, in, in what it means to be baptized spiritually, through the regeneration and 
and the redemption and repentance. May God open up this and his word to us so that we can see and visualize it for ourselves. Anyways, I would like to just close in prayer right now. Lord God, we just come to you today. Lord, we thank you for all you've done. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for the gate. Lord, when sin was opened into our world through the disobedience of Adam and sin brought into the world, Lord, that that sin is crouching at the door for every one of us here. But Lord, you have not left us without witness because at that same door, wisdom cries out. And at that same place, at that same path that leads to destruction, your cross stands in the middle of that path to say, return, you're redeemed. And may you don't have to let that sin scratch at you and eat at you anymore. Because I will fill you with my Holy Spirit again and restore all things. Lord, as, as we look at these days of Elijah, Lord, may we be restored. May we have that spirit of reconciliation again so that we can, can look forward to connecting and being restored to the perfect relationship with the Father. And Lord, we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.